Hello, and welcome back to the ASCO Journal of Oncology Practice podcast. This is Dr. Nate Pinnell, medical oncologist at the Cleveland Clinic and consultant editor for the JOP. On March 3rd and 4th of this year, ASCO held its annual quality care symposium in Orlando, Florida. And in August of this year, this month, the JOP published a special issue covering presentations and publications from that symposium. So we were hoping to highlight a symposium and these publications in this month's podcast. Joining me today is Dr. Michael Noyce, Professor of Medicine and Chief Medical Officer at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center. He is also a former chair of the ASCO COPE Steering Group, former chair of the Quality Committee and the Clinical Practice Committees, and he was a co-editor and also authored the foreword for the special issue. Mike, thanks so much for joining me today. Nate, thank you for talking to me. It's great to be able to talk about the Quality of Care Symposium that we had this past year. This was the fifth Quality Care Symposium since its inception in 2012. And I think one of the more exciting and stimulating meetings I've been to this year. Well, that's great. Why don't you talk a little bit more about the Quality Care Symposium? So I know that ASCO obviously cares a lot about quality with their COPE program, but uh, why did they feel it was necessary to have a separate, distinct symposium from the annual meeting? Is it just a reflection of how, how big it's become as a field? In large part, because efforts of Doug Blaney in the year following his being president of ASCO, the Quality of Care Symposium was started to give people a little more social and calmer environment than the annual meeting to talk about quality activities that were going on, either as a result of some of the ASCO programs or just as a result of the quality movement in general. As you know, it's easy and wonderful to see some of the scientific breakthroughs that have occurred in oncology care over the past few years. But as was shown by Ethan Bosch's presentation at this year's annual meeting, you can do simple things where you pay attention to the patients and have an impact on their overall survival. And the quality symposium was the result of people in health services research and others uh, interested in the process of delivering care and simple things we could do to improve patient care and patient experience and to get together and talk together and present our research findings. Four papers that presented research findings from the abstracts presented at this year's meeting have come out since the meeting, two in this issue of JOP and two earlier, and they provide an interesting summary of the types of work that people have been doing. How did you end up deciding which papers were going to be published in this particular issue of the JOP? We have a extensive review process of the abstracts submitted, just like the ASCO annual meeting and other meetings. And based on the scoring of the abstracts, these were the top abstracts that were submitted to us for presentation at the meeting. And we simply chose those that were the best four abstracts, the highest scoring four abstracts for presentation. And not all of them were actually published in this issue, though, were they? No, we've noticed the trend in simultaneous publication with presentation. And because of that, and because of the efforts of the wonderful staff at the Journal of Oncology Practice, including the editor, John Cox, we were able to concurrently electronically publish two papers with the meeting. And to be honest, we probably would have published all four of them concurrently if we had the editorial resources to do that, but we didn't this year. Well, maybe someone will listen to this podcast and, <laughs> and uh, make some changes. Do you mind briefly outlining the published studies, the top studies from the symposium? Well, one of the themes of the meeting was implementation science. As we all know, it's one thing to have a good idea and know that something's the right thing to do, and it's an entirely different thing to make it happen. And two of our papers that were electronically published concurrently with the meeting addressed that issue. One by Dr. Adeboye and others talked about reducing the use of GCSF in patients with lung cancer who were receiving chemotherapy. For those of us who participate in the oncology care model and have seen reports of the different drugs and the expenses associated with different drugs, the use of CSFs to support myeloid cells is one of the major drug expenses in chemotherapy treatment. 
And many of us have had a sense that these are overused. Dr. Adeboye and colleagues looked at the use of GCSF in patients with lung cancer receiving palliative chemotherapy and the rate of use and showed that it was excessive relative to practice guidelines and the risk of neutropenic fever and that they were able with guideline implementation to um, decrease the use of this without having any negative impact on the rate of neutropenic fever in these lung cancer patients. It's really important as a result, and it was a stimulating discussion. A perhaps more fun discussion was by Dr. Weiss et al., who talked about a rate of chemotherapy errors through a deliberate improvement science effort at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, where they exclusively treat children. They've noticed that even with decision support within the Beacon EPIC chemotherapy ordering system, they've had a few errors that they wanted to decrease. Now, most of their errors were in the timing of leucoborne doses in people receiving high-dose methotrexate, as is so often the case in children's hospital. But they decided that they could avoid the errors of people entering orders incorrectly by really letting people focus on their work as they were entering errors. The somewhat amusing process of putting bright orange sound reduction headphones on the providers who were writing the chemotherapy orders, who were by wearing these headphones, transmitting information that they were not to be bothered because they were doing something important at the time they were using those. And into the project, as is reported in the paper, which is also in the Journal of Oncology Practice, they reported a significant decrease in the error rate from 3.8 to 1.9 per 1,000 doses, and they've sustained this reduction in error rates since they did the study. And as we learned in the wonderful talk by Drs. Chambers and Mitchell on implementation science, which is also summarized in an article in this issue of JOP, we learned how hard it was to actually make these changes happen and sustain these after implementation. Well, that sounds really interesting. I can think of lots of other things that I would like to be able to wear bright orange headphones for and have people leave me alone at work. But it's interesting that such a simple idea could lead to a significant change. It is indeed. Two other papers that were published in the Journal of Journal of Oncology Practice included work from Stanford, from Julie Porter and others, including Doug Blaney, who, as I mentioned earlier, was the inaugural sponsor of the Quality Symposium, looked at engagement of physicians in the development of quality measures to be used for their own financial rewards. This is something that's been done for a long time in private practices, particularly practices that were acquired by hospital systems as a vehicle to reward physicians for maintaining focus on quality activities. And this project at Stanford involved developing different quality measures for the oncology program using national standards such as the COPE quality measures and other measures to come up with a battery or a set of 15 questions to look at. And they demonstrated that the physicians remained engaged in the process when they had developed these measures and also worked to improve the measures within their practices. They looked at very simple things like staging for cancer, which has long been sort of identified as important for physicians to do and remarkably infrequently done by physicians in their care of cancer patients. And by remarkably infrequently, I say it's just not 100%. It's about 70% of the time in the past. The last of the four papers that was published was by Dr. Greg Judy and others from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and they looked at factors that were associated with misses or near misses in patients on radiation therapy. Not surprisingly, but it's important to demonstrate when unsurprising things happen that they really are happening. They found that the more complicated the treatment was, the more likely there was to be an error And additionally, that treating head and neck tumors was associated with an increased error rate over treating more straightforward things, for example, whole brain radiation. Additionally, if they used IMRT, they were more likely to make a mistake. 
And if they used image-guided radiation therapy, there may be some other problems in the daily treatment. I think there's a common theme in all of these papers, which was looking at the complexity of practice, the risk to patients resulting from the complexity of practice, and the importance, whether it's by wearing bright headphones or simply working in a quiet environment with focus, of reducing the external and extraneous stimulation that leads us to making mistakes, whether it's too many pieces of data to integrate or too chaotic an environment. It reminds all of us of Atul Gawande's checklist manifesto and the importance of finding a way to get above the noise and focus on the important things to look at to deliver patient safety. Well, hopefully that will whet the appetite of our readers to try to dig into the issue in the past publications during the live presentations back in March and raise interest for next year's Quality Care Symposium. I'm in. Mike, thanks so much for joining me today to talk about the symposium and about the special issue. Nate, it was fabulous to talk to you, and I'm glad that we could stimulate some interest in the Quality Symposium. And I also want to thank our listeners out there who joined us today for this podcast. The special Quality Care Symposium issue is available online now at ascopubs.org backslash journal backslash J-O-P. This is Dr. Nate Pinnell for the Journal of Oncology Practice signing off.